Well, I'm excited to kick off a brand new series today entitled Minor Prophets. Uh, Minor Prophets, if you've been in church, this is that section of the Bible uh, that is similar to the flyover states of America. A lot of people fly right over them. You hear about them in Sunday school or VBS, but it's not something that we visit a lot. But our pastor and our leadership sat down and said, what would it look like to go uh, into the minor prophets and extrapolate an, an extreme message that we all need to hear? We firmly believe that the minor prophets have a major message for all of us. Each week this summer, we're going to take a book of the Minor Prophets and summarize. We're not going, to go, not going to go through the entire book. We're going to summarize that book, and we're going to have 12 books of the Bible that we're going to walk through each and every week. Today, I have the opportunity to dive into the book of Hosea, who was a minor prophet. Before I just throw out those words and assume you know what I'm talking about, let me tell you just three things about a prophet in the Bible. A prophet was a man or woman of God that God chose to speak on behalf of him. The second thing is usually the word that God gave the man or woman that was a prophet was a hard truth designated to turn the people back to God. The third thing is when prophets spoke, their messages often went unheeded and ignored and they themselves were despised. That's the filter that I want you to think through and think about the entire summer as we talk about these prophets. Today, as I dive into the book of Hosea, I want to open up our time together with a story. There was a billionaire who hosted a party at his mansion. Towards the end of the night, he invited all of his guests to the backyard for some entertainment. He invited them to the backyard to look at his pool full of alligators. He invited these guests back to the backyard. They went uh, circled around the pool. They're looking at these alligators. He's telling them the names of each alligator, telling them where they come from and all of these different things about these alligators. This host of the party, this billionaire was known to dare people to do extreme things. So he says, hey, before you all leave tonight, I want to dare every single one of you, whoever's willing to take me up on it, to jump into the pool from this end, swim to the other end, and if you make it out alive, I will give you your weight in gold. There was a hush over the party. He said, okay, I'll up the ante. Not only will I give you your weight in gold, I'll also throw in this mansion you see behind me. No one said anything. He thought, okay, this is an extreme dare, so I understand why nobody's taking me up on it. He chuckled, got ready to dismiss the party guests to go home, and all of a sudden, all of them heard a splash behind them. They turn around to see, and they look, and there's a man in the pool fighting for his life, swimming to the other side. Every step of the way, there are alligators chomping at the bit to get a piece of this man. He's swimming for his life, fighting for his life. What seemed like hours at a time only took a couple of seconds. He swam to the other side, jumped out, stood up, bent over in exhaustion, and was huffing and puffing. The party guests ran to the other side of the pool, checking on him, asking if he was okay. The billionaire pushed through the crowd and said, hey, I'm a man of my word. I'm going to give you your weight in gold, and I'm going to give you this mansion behind me. But first, you got to tell me what possessed you to do that. The man, out of breath, looked up and said, I don't care about any weight. I don't care about a mansion. Point me in the direction of the person who pushed me in. (laughs) I don't want no gold. I don't want no mansion. I want to fight. Let me ask you this, people of CBC, have you ever been pushed into a situation that that you didn't expect to be in? Have you ever been pushed into a situation that felt like it was too much to handle? Maybe for you, you were pushed into a project at work and you feel like, man, I feel like I'm in over my head. Maybe for you, you say, Marquise, I got some more weightier things that I've been pushed to in my life. I was pushed into an unplanned pregnancy. I felt like it was too much to handle. Marquise, I was pushed into a divorce that caught me by surprise. 
Man, Marquise, I was pushed out of a job that I thought I would be at much longer. See, we all know what it's like to be pushed into a situation that we weren't ready for, either by life's circumstances or by our own choices. But here's what I want to ask you today. What happens when we're pushed by God into situations we don't feel ready for? See, there's often times where God will push us to do something that we're not expecting. Maybe for you in this room, God has pushed you to forgive someone who has hurt you beyond what you can even bear. Maybe God is pushing you to give financially when you feel like you have nothing left to give financially. Maybe God is pushing you to actually leave a job because he's telling you that he has something better for you. See, we all know what it's like to be pushed, but if you're a believer in this room, you also know what it's like to be pushed by God to do something that you feel ill-equipped to do. Today, I want to tell you what God pushed Hosea into that he felt like he was not prepared for. But before I jump into that, I want to tell you why God pushed Hosea. God pushed Hosea because Hosea lived in a time period that was very peculiar. The time period in which Hosea lived in, he lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. When the kingdom split, the southern kingdom was called Judah, and the northern kingdom of Israel is where Hosea lived. Instead of the people of God in the northern kingdom remaining steadfast to God, there was a pagan king who came in and brought in idols with him. When he brought these idols in, the people of God, instead of remaining true to God, adopted the ways of the world, and as a result, the land suffered. As a matter of fact, the time period in which Hosea lived, two things were taking place. I'm going to throw these two things up on the screens. The first thing was spiritual abandonment. People were leaving and abandoning their faith and adopting idols that the king brought in. As a result of that, cultural disintegration began to take place. The culture was disintegrating and waning away. Why? Because the people of God, instead of remaining true to God, adopted the ways of the world. I'm going to give you a sidebar real quick. Regardless of being the minority, regardless of whoever is in power, God never intended for his people to adopt the ways of the world. As a matter of fact, the things that take place, the byproduct of the people of God adopting the ways of the world is cultural disintegration. If you're keeping up, you realize this is not just something that's taking place in the time of Hosea, it's something that's taking place right now. We, right now, are living in a time period where we have a choice to make either as the minority, we're gonna remain true to God or we're going to adopt the ways of the world. We're either going to stay true to God or we're going to receive the idols, watch this, that the king brings in. And I wanna let you know right here, right now, that when we as the people of God do not follow God and abandon what God tells us to do, the entire land suffers. When we just go with the flow, when we just go with whatever culture is telling us to do, the land begins to suffer when the Christians aren't doing what God called them to do. That's how influential we are. Even as the minority, I want to let you know this, even as the minority, when we don't follow God, the culture suffers. And God is calling us to remain true to him. And so here Hosea is living in a time period where the people of God are not following God. As a matter of fact, the people in that time period, the, uh, the Israelites at that time, the children of God, they had the same problem that we have today. Here's our problem. It's in your outline. The problem is this. Our unfaithfulness no longer makes us uncomfortable. Our unfaithfulness to God no longer makes us feel uncomfortable. It's a good thing when you feel uncomfortable when you're doing something you ain't got no business doing. 
That conviction that you feel, watch this, is a gift from God. Every believer in this room, you know this, there's an alert system built into us when we give our life to Jesus called God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us. And whenever you feel that conviction, here's the deal. It's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation is God shaming and guilting you for your mistakes. Conviction is a loving father wooing you back to him, saying, hey, if you go down that path, it'll lead to destruction. Keep coming back to me. All of us know what it's like to feel that conviction, but what do you do when you get convicted? The people in this time period, they suppress that conviction. If you suppress conviction long enough, you'll start to feel comfortable living the way that you want to live. And our unfaithfulness should make us feel weird. I want to pray this over this entire room. I pray a feeling of uncomfortability over everyone listening to me who's living the way that God does not want them to live. I pray you get so uncomfortable that it forces you to live differently and to live for God. We all know what conviction is. I remember when I gave my life to Jesus in high school, I remember literally saying these words in high school and for college for that matter, I miss the days when I wasn't convicted. Oh, I miss the days when I just did what I wanted to do. There was no alert system. I didn't have to feel bad about anything. I miss those that I remember thinking to myself, I feel so Convicted. Can I say it this way? When I started to follow Jesus, I couldn't even sin right. I was trying, I was trying to sin, y'all. I was trying to do it. It just felt so weird to me. That conviction is built in. I'll never forget when my mom, my mom would always say these words before we hit the door. My parents had bought me and my twin brother these cars when we graduated. My first car was a Chrysler 300 on 22-inch rims. All black, I loved it. Remember we got those keys and at that point my parents realized they couldn't be with us every step of the way. They weren't gonna be with us everywhere we went. And so when we got these keys, my mom would always say these words. She's like, hey, Marquise, where you going? Uh, Mom, I'll be back, I'm just gonna go hang out. Okay, remember wherever you go, take the Lord with you. Ah. Oh. <laughs> why did you, I'm going back upstairs to go to sleep. I, what? You done put the Lord in my head? I was getting ready to go do craziness. But my mom would leave that, take, take the Lord with you. Even when I'm traveling, hey mom, on a plane, getting ready to go preach. Okay, take the Lord with you. Why? What she's doing is she's laying before me this conviction that the Lord has a purpose and a plan for my life. Amen. And the same is true for all of us. The time period in which Hosea lived, the people of, the God, of God suppressed that conviction. And people of God, I want to let you know that that conviction is a good, loving father telling you to come back to himself. So because Hosea was a prophet, and because Hosea was not suppressing that conviction, he was a stand-up man of integrity. God used Hosea as a prophet to tell a hard truth to the people of Israel. So God said, I'm going to use Hosea in an illustrative sermon. I'm going to use your life, Hosea, as an illustrative sermon to do something, to call the people back to me. So the word of the Lord came to Hosea, and God pushed Hosea to do something that he felt very ill-equipped to do. Hosea chapter 1 Verse 2 says this, when the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute. Let's pause for a second. <laughs> I feel like I got to stop. We can't just keep moving. Here's a man of God, a holy man of God. And God comes to him and says, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. Could you imagine what Hosea is thinking, like, am I hearing God right? Could you imagine if Hosea had a men's group and that Monday night when they got together, they got around to Hosea, hey, before we leave, 
Just like, hey, Hosea, like, what do you feel like God's telling you in this season? <laughs> if I'm Hosea, pass. I'm not this week. <laughs> let, me, let me come back to y'all next week, guys. I feel like the Lord's telling me to marry a prostitute. The men in that men's group most likely was like, ah, <laughs> probably not God. That's probably a fantasy of yours, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna restore you. We're going to restore you. <laughs> Let me also say this, I don't want to just stand up here and flippantly say those words. I know the reach that CBC has. If you're in this room or you're watching me online and you're someone who is in that lifestyle of prostitution, I want to let you know something. God is using this lifestyle as an illustration. He's not beating up the individuals in that lifestyle. If that's you today and you find yourself stuck in a situation and you can't get out of it, I want to let you know this is not the beat you up church. This is the pick you up church. You, you don't have to stay that way. God loves you too much to let you stay where you are. God has a purpose and a plan for your life and you can leave that life. I want to just say that and take that time as a pastor, to just add that pastoral caveat. But God comes to Hosea and says, I want my people to turn back to me. So I'm going to use you as an illustrative sermon to tell them that I love them. And the sermon goes on to say this in Hosea chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. Go and marry a prostitute so that her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Dibli Diblium, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. God used this illustrative message to tell the people of Israel, you have forsaken me. And here, Hosea, a holy man of God, wondering, God, how can you send me out to go do something like this? I'm an upstanding citizen in this world. People look to me to hear from you, and you want me to go to this place that is unholy? You want me to go and intertwine with someone who's living opposite of the way that you want them to live? You want me, a holy God, to fraternize and intertwine with someone who's unholy? God is saying, yes, just like I, a holy God, went to rescue a broken and unholy people. I'm going to use your life as an illustration that I'm going to the people that have forsaken me. And I want them to turn back to me. So Hosea goes and marries this woman by the name of Gomer goes and marries Gomer. And just for the sake of time, chapter one, God tells Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. He finds and marries Gomer. Chapter two, they have children together, three children together. In chapter two, after having children together, uh, uh, Gomer leaves Hosea and goes back into a life of prostitution. Here Hosea is God, I did exactly what you wanted me to do. I went out and married this woman. We had children together. We, we were doing what you called us to do, but she went back to her old way of living. And as I look at this picture, I'm thinking about Gomer. And here Gomer is living a blessed life, having a husband who wants to take care of her. Having a loving, holy, godly husband who wants to be in her life. They bear three children together. They are blessed. They have a blessing of children in their life. By all intents and purposes, they are living the blessed life. But then I wondered to myself, if I was preparing myself for this message, why would Gomer go back to that lifestyle? But before we point the finger at Gomer, here's what I want you to write down. The first parallel in your outline is this. Just like Gomer, we are unfaithful to God. Just like Gomer, we can become unfaithful 
to God, when we are, are married to Christ and God changes our life, he picks us up and he turns us around. He dusts us off from the life that we once lived and we're living for him and we're blessed and he's given us blessing and he's allowing us to live a new life. How many of us, myself included, have returned back to the life we once lived? And Gomer, watch this, was enticed away from her new identity to go live a life that she used to live. Let me tell you, people of God, you will be enticed away from your identity in Christ by the enemy. The enemy will try to woo you and get you away from your identity in Christ. Even though you are living for God and trying your best to follow him, your past will be there every step of the way, just like it was with Gomer. Gomer, you're not, you're not a wife. No, no, come back to this life of prostitution. There's no way you can be a mother to three children. Remember what you used to do? Remember your old way? And the enemy wooed her back to go live a life that she once lived. Here's why I believe Goma went back to that life that she once lived, because she played that game that a lot of us play. Even though she was doing right and, and, and living with her husband and had these three children, there was that thing within her that said, how much can I do? How far back can I go and it still be something that I'm okay with? How close to the line of sin can I get and still feel good? I used to be a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and high school students would always play this game. The, pl the game was simply that. How close to the line can I get and still not call it sin? Y'all know that game. We played it ourselves as adults. We played that game of like, okay, like how, how close? I, I know that I'm a recovering alcoholic, but I just want to hang out with people that drink. I'm not going to drink, but I just want to hang out with them. I know I used to live a life and I had this addiction and I know that this thing used to trip me up, but I'm not going to do it. I just want to, I just want to flirt with it. One of my high school students, I'm not going to say his name, but one of my high school students from, from uh, my years as a youth pastor, I remember him, he was saying, Marquise, like, I'm trying to live for God. I got this girlfriend. I'm trying to live pure. Like, I got to just ask you, like, okay, like, is holding hands sin? No? Okay. Can I, or is hugging a sin? No? Okay. Um, can we kiss? It's kissing, is it? Can we tongue kiss? Can we kiss laying down? I'm like, brother, what? <laughs> How close to the line are you trying to get? <laughs> and all of us, we play that game of, no, I got this. No, I'm, I'm strong enough. I've, I've been away for it from some time now, and I can go back and just look. I'm not going to not going to engage. Every time you play this game of, I just want to get close to the line. I want to let you know the enemy wants you to get close to the line so he can pull you over the line. He, he doesn't play. He doesn't play games. He's playing for keeps. He wants to get you close to the line so he can get you over the line. People of God, God wants us to move away from the line and live for him. I want to give you this short autobiography that has completely changed the way I look at temptation. So we're all going to be tempted. We're all going to be enticed in our life. But I read this autobiography. It's five chapters long. There's a woman by the name of Portia Nelson that wrote this autobiography. She looked back over her life. And she said, this is an autobiography of my life of how I avoided temptation. The name of her autobiography is There's a Hole in My Sidewalk. Chapter one, there's only a couple of sentences in each chapter. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in, I am lost, I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find a way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street there is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, 
I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit, but my eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. Man, I'm telling you, people of God, If you are going to live for God and not suppress the truth, if you want to remain faithful to God, it's going to take you walking down a different street. It's going to take you deciding to walk down a street that avoids the temptation all together. Because there's no doubt in my mind when Gomer went back to that lifestyle, it felt comfortable it felt like, man, this is, this is probably the life that I was supposed to be living the entire time. My identity is that I am a prostitute, and she got stuck there, and her identity became, this is where I'll always be. And maybe there's a believer in this room under the sound of my voice or watching me online that believes this is, all, this is just who I am. This is who I'll always be. I'm I'm stuck here and I just feel like I've messed up. I've ruined the plan that God has for me. I've gone too far. I've strayed away too far. I want to tell you some good news today. The second point in your outline is this. Here's the second parallel. Just like Hosea, God has not stopped pursuing you. God has not stopped pursuing you. And I know you feel stuck. I know you feel like this is your identity, but God doesn't want to leave you there. God doesn't want to leave you where you are. God is pursuing you today, people of God. You may feel lost. You may feel like you've lost your way, but God has not stopped pursuing you. Chapter one, God tells Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. Chapter two, they have three children together. And Gomer leaves this life of of being with Hosea. She leaves her children and her husband behind and goes back into a life of prostitution. Hosea is sitting there thinking to himself, God, what do you want me to do now? I did exactly what you wanted me to do. What do you want me to do next? Chapter 3, the good news comes in. Chapter 3, verse 1 up on the screen says this, go Show love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. You you want me to do what? You want me to go and love my wife who has left me? This person who has broken our vows, she's left me with these three children to raise all by myself. That's what you want me to go and do? And God is saying, you're missing the picture. You are me in this story. And Gomer are the people of God in this story. And although they've lost their way, they got to remind themselves that I'm still married to them. And I'll go wherever they find themselves. I will still pursue them. And so, get this, watch this. Watch this. God is saying, Hosea, you are me in this story. I need you to go back and love and show love to your wife again. I know she's left you. I know she's broke your heart. I know she's been unfaithful, but you need to pursue her because I need the children of Israel to see that they belong to me. So here's what Hosea does. Chapter three, verse two, up on the screens. It's not in your outlines. It says this. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Hosea went back and paid for his wife to come back home. I need you to know this. This came to me after I submitted my outline. It's not in your outlines, but I need you to write this down. Just like Gomer, you were bought with a price. I got to say it again. Just like Gomer, you were bought with a a price. And I know when you feel stuck and you feel like there's no way that God loves me where I am and the enemy will try to get you to believe that you belong to him. 
But that's not the case. God paid for you, not with, his, uh, not with gold and not with silver. He paid for you with the blood of Jesus. Here's what you need to know. God did not steal you from the enemy. If God stole you from the enemy, that means the enemy had rights to you. The enemy can't come to God and say, he belongs to me. She belongs to me. They are mine. Because in that event, what God would do is say, the, these are my children. And not only are they my children, I have the receipt for their life. At that moment, he would bring Jesus to the forefront and say, my son died for them. If you need a receipt, look at my son's left hand where the nail went through. If you need another receipt, look at his right hand where the nail went through. If you need another receipt, look at his feet where the nail pierced him. If you need one more receipt, look at his side where the Roman soldier pierced him and blood and water poured out of his side for his children. I want to let you know there's a receipt over your life. There's a receipt over your life and it's the blood of Jesus. If you need to be reminded that you belong to God, look to Jesus. If you need to be reminded how much you're worth, look at the wounds in Jesus' hands. Jesus said, my blood spilled for them. You were bought with the price. And Hosea is God in this story. And he says, go and pay for your wife, just like I'm going to pay for my children. People of God, the enemy will try to trick you to believe that you are his. But any item that has a receipt tells you who's the rightful owner. God has bought you with a price. Here's the last and final thing you need to know. God is not mad at you. God is not angry with you. Here's what a good, loving father is doing for you and to you today. Just like Israel, God is pleading with you. He's pleading with you. The last chapter of Hosea chapter 14 says, return Israel to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Here's what God is doing. If you're a believer in this room or you know a believer and they've strayed away and they've wandered away and they think that they're too far gone, remind them that God is pleading with them. Come back to me. I'm not, I'm not waiting on you so that I can beat you over the head. Come back to me. I'm a good, loving father. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened down, and I will give you rest. People of God, he is pleading with us to return back to him. Not because he's angry. He's standing there with open arms to let you know, I paid for you, and I got a better life for you. Now that you've entered into covenant with God, you're married to him. You're married to Christ. This is the picture of Hosea. Tell my people I'm married to them. And God, he doesn't have the type of love that we have. He doesn't have as long as type of love. As long as you do right, I'll love you. As long as you treat me right, I'll honor you. As long as things are good, I'll be good to you. No, he has even if type of love. Even if you walk out that door, I'll still be right here waiting on you to come back. Even if you leave me, even if you mess up, even if you make mistakes, even if you find yourself stuck, I'm still married to you. The three words that I want to leave with you today that God is saying to us that we are married to Christ. Here's the three words I want to leave with you. It's the title of my message. God is saying to you today, I still do. We're married. I still do love you. I still do have a purpose for you. I still do have a plan for your life. And the reason why this message is so major and so critical is because the enemy loves to get you to think that you're too far gone. Believers in this room, don't ever get too comfortable where you just think, 
I can hear about the love of God and it falls on deaf ears. Oh, the king of the universe loves you, loves you so much. He cares about you. He is, he is invested in you. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. He's concerned about you. And even as believers, we need to be reminded of this. I need to be reminded of this. I can't believe, as a matter of fact, Ricky, you don't even know this man, but you bless me. Just the other last month, a friend of mine by the name of Ricky, he sent down front. He has no idea that his words bless me. I need to be reminded of this. We were at men's retreat. And ever since I had my boys, I have two kids, so a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Ever since I've had my sons, every time I've gotten on a plane, I've had anxiety that I was going to die. I didn't really tell people, I'm thinking this plane is going to go down. i got to be here for my boys. I have anxiety, extreme anxiety that I'm getting ready to die, that this plane is going to crash. And I was just at men's retreat. And I was up, and I remember sharing with you, Ricky, and I just happened to say, bro, I get on planes, and I'm just nervous. I travel a lot to go and speak other places, and every time, for the last three years, every single plane ride, I thought to myself, this plane's going to go down. Last month, I shared that at the group of people, or the group of men at a table, and Ricky looked at me and said, yeah, but you got to remember, even if you did die, God loves your family more than you do. And, and I'm telling you, Ricky, that one sentence... I've probably been on five planes since that last time we talked. I sit on that plane, I go right to sleep. <laughs> Knocked out. I, I mean, turbulence. I mean, I'm not out. I didn't know you were going to be here, but I wanted to remind, I wanted to tell you that. Here's why I say that. God, I had to be reminded in that moment. No, Marquise, you don't have control over this life. Even if you were out the picture, guess what? God is still in the picture. God loves you, Marquise. He loves your family. God loves my boys more than I do. And you got to remember that God loves you. I say that to just say God loves you so much. God has invested in your life. Here's our target statement, and I'll get out of your way. I believe, I say this all the time, blessed is the young preacher that is short-winded. Okay, for he shall be invited back. <laughs> Here's our target statement. Our unfaithfulness to God has no bearing on God's love for us. God's love for us outweighs our unfaithfulness to him. So here's what we're going to do. Two things. We're going to decide and we're going to abide. How do, how do I get back? How do I get back on track? How, do, can, how can I come back to God, Marquise? Here's what you do. You decide today to get up from where you are, to call out to God, and you abide with him. You have the opportunity today to decide, man, I'm a believer, but I haven't, I haven't been living the way that God wants me to live. I'm a believer, but I've strayed away I've been unfaithful to God. Good news, we all have. Today, decide to get up from wherever you are. And once you decide to come back, abide with him. Psalm 91.1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in them shall bear much fruit. People of God, abide today. Decide and abide. If you're a believer in this room, this is good news for us because we've all found our way off the path that God has for us. But also I wanna give an opportunity for an unbeliever in this room. You've been listening to this message or you've been deciding or thinking about if you want to follow God and today you're thinking to yourself, man, if it's true what this man is saying up on that stage, I've never known a love like this, but if there's a God that loves me this much, that's not expecting me to hold my life together and never make mistakes, there's a God that's that invested in me. 
I want to give my life to him. Today, I want to give you that opportunity to decide to follow him. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I want to let you know the reason why we go crazy, the reason why we're excited, the reason why we do baptism, is because a man that found us in our brokenness and loved us, not because of us, but in spite of us. Today, I want to give you that opportunity. We're going to say a prayer of faith, a prayer of repentance together to encourage those around us who want to place their faith in Jesus for the very first time. Just repeat after me, and if you believe these words, we believe that God is waiting to accept you as one of his own. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me, change me, forgive me. I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer in faith, here's what just took place. You were transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You may not feel different, but salvation is not based on a feeling. It's based on faith. And I want to let you know, we want to celebrate you. If that's you in this room today, lift that hand high, elbow above the ear. I place my faith in Jesus. I'm deciding to follow Him.